In this video, we go over how to use function notation effectively when analyzing the graph of a function. Let's get started. To begin, I've given you an example here of a graph of a function because it passes the vertical line test. Every input produces one output, right? So we look at this graph, y equals f of x, and we see that it's given me some points, and it's kind of like an interesting curve. It has some solid points, it has some open points, and now we're about to ask you some questions and see if you understand what we're asking. So we, we're giving you some points and we're giving you some information about the graph. All right, so the first question that we're asking you to find is f of negative one. And you might be thinking, Professor, I have no idea what that means. You have not given me the equation. Therefore, I cannot give you the answer. And that would be an interesting response. However, it would be incorrect. You have enough information to answer this question. Why is that? Because what they've effectively told you by saying f of negative one is here is the input. And what is an input? It's an x value. So they've told you that when x is negative one, your job is to find the output, f of x. Outputs are simply y values. So they're simply saying, when x is negative one, when that's your input, what is your output y? Okay, so simply looking at the graph at negative one for an input of x, what is our output? And we look and see that there is a point there that was filled in, and that point said negative one comma one, meaning we know the output is the y value of one. So believe it or not, you had enough information to answer that question using function notation. You might also be thinking, Professor, why didn't you just say that? Well, we did, but you needed to get used to how to say that in function notation. So let's take a look at another one. Maybe you can try this one on your own. What does it mean for me to ask you to find f of 2, f parentheses 2? That's right. It's saying when the input x value is given to you as 2, what is the appropriate output y? So at x equals 2, you can go to your graph, and you say, OK, at this location, where is the graph? What is the output? The output looks like it's down at this point, and the output is the y value of negative 3. So if you said negative 3, you were right. Now, on the other hand, some of you may have been tempted to go over to the point on the far right of that picture, 5 comma 2, and say the answer was 5, right? But that would have been if I had asked you for the input, which gave you the output 2, right? That's a different question. And in, in that case, technically, there's a couple of different inputs that gave you the output of 2. If you look here carefully, there's another one over here somewhere. Okay, so let's take a look at the next question they ask you. They're asking, hmm, is f of 3 going to be positive or negative? What is that saying? Well, f of 3, again, is saying what is the output at the input x being, negative, being positive 3. So when x is positive 3, let's go to our graph here. When x is positive 3, that would be this location here. Where is our function? Well, the function appears to have an output around here somewhere, down here, below the x-axis. We're not told exactly what that point is, but we are told where it is. It's below the x-axis, meaning our output is negative in that situation. So we can answer questions specifically if given information like the point itself, or we can ask you questions generally. Is this a negative or a positive output? That should be easy to tell. Finally, this question is a little bit tricky, so watch out. For which value or values of x would f of x be less than 0? What is that saying? Again, in English, can we think about what that's saying? For which values of x, so what inputs, give us outputs, f of x, which are below 0? Well, outputs, those are your y values. To, be y values, to have y values which are below 0 to be less than 0 means that they're negative y values. In other words, they are below the x-axis. So where is my graph below the x-axis. Let's take a look. It appears to be the blo below the x-axis between the x value of 1 and the x value of 4. In other words, between 1 and 4. Now, could you write that in interval notation, x values between 1 and 4? Yeah, you could list the number 1, comma 4, but are you going to include 1 and 4 or not include 1 or 4? Well, let's think about that. It says strictly below the x-axis. So at 1 and at 4, are your outputs below the x-axis or are they on the x-axis? They're actually on it, aren't they? So I would say parentheses tells the reader that you're not actually including the number 1 or 4. You're just including the numbers between 1 and 4. That would give you outputs below the x-axis, negative outputs. So that's a little tricky for sure to get used to. Notice that if I had said instead, when are my outputs going to be greater than zero? That would have been in two separate regions, wouldn't it? 
That would have been in this space here between this x value of negative 1 and this x value of positive 1, and again to the right of 4 but less than 5. Okay? So that would have been in two different regions where my graph is actually above the x-axis. And I could have used that union symbol to say here or here. Okay, I didn't ask you for it, but I want you to start thinking about it. What about x-intercepts and y-intercepts? Have they given us enough information to answer that question? Well, yeah, I think they have. For x-intercepts, that really means any time your output is on the x-axis. When is your output on the x-axis? Well, that would mean to be on the x-axis that your y-value is 0. So we do see that happening at 1 and at x equals, let's see if I can move that, 4. So it looks like when x is 1 and when x is 4, those are your two x-intercepts. You could also write them as ordered pairs, the point 1, 0, and 4, 0, since the output of y there is 0. What about the y-intercept? Is there a y-intercept they've given me? Well, yeah, that's going to be any point on my trajectory, which is on the y-axis. And if it's a function, I can only have one of those, because if it was in two places, it would fail the vertical line test. I do, in fact, see a y-intercept. That's at 0, 3, so it's the y-value of 3. You could simply say y equals 3, or the point um, that would be 0, 3. x is 0 when y is 3. Finally, domain and range might be a little bit tricky for some of you. Domain, again, is a set of all inputs which are allowed. So what x values are allowed to be used and put into this function? Well, it looks like we start with the x value of negative 1, and we are allowed to continue using any x value until we get to the x value of 5. And at 5, notice that we have an open circle, which tells the reader that that is a boundary, but you're not including that point for existence. So the domain would have been negative 1 was closed, so that would be a bracket, until you get to the x value of 5 with a parenthesis, because you are not allowed to actually exist at the point 5, 2. Can you try range on your own? What y values are allowed to be reached as outputs? Yeah, the lowest y value I see is negative 3, right? That's this minimum value that I see down here. We'll talk more about minimums and maximums in future videos. So that minimum y value that I see as an output is negative 3. I do see a closed circle originally. If you remove all of my coloring on it, there was a closed circle there. So that would be a bracket. We're allowed to include negative 3 as my lowest y value. And now we look and we go above that and see if there's any breaks in the graph or if there's a place where we stop growing. So we notice that as we go to the left, there's no break in the graph. It goes all the way up to the y value of 3 and then back down to the y value of 1. And on the right, it goes all the way up to the y value of 2, but it doesn't actually include 2 itself there. So what is the highest y value that I'm allowed to reach? I'm allowed to reach the y value of 3, and I'm allowed to include it. Now, what, you might be thinking, what about that 2? I'm not allowed to include it. Well, notice that on the other side of the graph, you do, in fact, include that y value of 2 and even between 2 and 3, don't you? So you are allowed to include any y value between negative 3 and positive 3. They might lo be located in different places, but you do get reached. So that, again, will take some practice for sure using interval notations and finding domain and range intercepts and function notation for a graph. We're going to practice these skills for the rest of our two examples. So if you need to pause and go over this one carefully, feel free. So let me clear that and go to my next page here. In example one, it says, suppose we give you the equation. So instead of giving you the graph, I've given you the equation of the function. I've also provided the link to the Desmos graph in the notes if you want to check out visually what's going on. It says f of x equals negative 3x squared plus 5x, and it says to answer the following questions. Can you think about what kind of graph this would be without even looking at Desmos? It's a parabola, isn't it? In fact, it's a parabola opening down because the leading coefficient is negative. OK, so it's a parabola opening down. And the first question they're asking you is kind of different. It says, can you tell me whether or not this point is on the trajectory? Right? Is negative 1, 2 going to be on the trajectory? Well, how would you know that? Right? If you're really a point on the graph, wouldn't that mean that if you input a number, you get that output? So let's take a look. If you input negative 1, do you get the output of 2? If you do, then that's a point on the trajectory, isn't it? So let's take a look at f of negative 1. Well, that would mean that we'd have negative 3 times negative 1 to the second power plus 5 times negative 1. We reviewed function notation in our last video. If you need to go back, feel free. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. Positive 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And then 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. So I'm getting an output of negative 8. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Well, that means when I input negative 1, my output on this trajectory should be a negative 8. 
but they're saying negative one, two would be the point on the graph. And we're saying, no, it's not a point on the graph because we did not get the output of two. What's the next question asking us? Well, it's saying if x equals negative two, what is f of x? Well, another way of saying that, they could have simply said, can you find f of negative two? Right, let x be negative two, same thing. Yeah, you can do that, no problem. Try it on your own. Did you do negative three times negative two squared plus five times negative two? Okay, then that means you would have had negative two squared, which is four. Four times negative three is negative 12. And five times negative two is negative 10. So your output there should have been negative 12 minus 10, which is negative 22. In other words, the point on the graph on this trajectory is negative two comma negative 22. When x is negative two, the output is negative 22. Now notice how b and c look similar but are asking you different questions. In b, we gave you the input and asked you for the output. We gave you the x and asked you for the y. In C, we give you f of x equaling negative two and ask you to come up with appropriate input that would make this happen. So what is x? Well, in order to answer this question, it would take a little more time, and I won't go through all the details because this is assessing skills that we've already talked about, but this would be saying replace your y value with negative two. So this would mean negative two equals negative three x squared plus five x. Now this particular type of equation takes time to solve. This is a quadratic equation. So I'll at least get you started, but I won't go through all the details in this video. You can go back to previous ones if you need help with it. I think our first video in the series. So this would have been zero equaling negative three x squared plus five x plus two, a quadratic equation which could be solved either by factoring if possible, the square root formula if possible, but the ones that always work with the quadratic formula and completing the square. Now I believe, this is number C here, that when I did C, I got answers of, let's see here, do, 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 let me grab it here, negative, is that right? Yes, I believe I ended up getting negative one third and positive two. And so you can check that on your own in the Desmos graph as well. Negative one third and positive two were the two x values that actually make this happen. And you could verify that, right? If you plug in negative one third, do you in fact get negative two? If you plug in two, do you in fact get negative two? And check that on Desmos, okay, using the quadratic formula. Now for domain, on the other hand, we talked about that quite a bit already in the previous video. Domain of a function has restrictions when we have square roots or fractions, in, as far as you know so far. And we don't have either one of those. So the domain here would simply be any real number. And that always will hold when we have a polynomial like a line or a parabola, et cetera. As far as finding x-intercepts, that's when we let y equal zero. So this equation becomes just like part c, the same type of process here, where we let our y value equal zero. So zero equals negative three x squared plus five x. And when you do that, that one you could factor or use a quadratic formula on. I believe the answers I got were zero and five thirds. So x would end up being zero and five thirds by either using the quadratic formula, completing the square, et cetera, or factoring. So those will take time. The y-intercept is the easiest part of the whole puzzle here because the y-intercept is simply when x is zero. So to let x equal zero, that's really saying, can you find f of zero? Well, if you put in zero here, negative three times zero squared is negative three times zero, which is zero, plus five times zero, which is zero. In other words, anytime you have x raised to a power and you're replacing x with zero, those terms all go away. So we're basically aware here that the only y-intercept is at the origin, which made sense because we had an x-intercept at the origin, which means they are on both axes at the same time. Okay, so I've done one example with you. Try pausing the video and doing B, I'm sorry, example two on your own. It's exactly like example one, just with a different function. So example two, we had the function f of x equals x squared plus two over x plus four. And so in this situation, we're asked the same questions is negative one, two on the graph. So we would begin by simply replacing x with negative one. So f of negative one would mean negative one is getting squared plus two all over negative one plus four. And if you carefully do that, one, you'll get one plus two, which is three. You'll get negative one plus four, which is three. So it turns out in this case that you end up getting an output of three over three, which is just one nice number, right? Who would have thought? So when x is negative one, y is also one. 
Now, they had suggested that the output would be 2, which is not the case. So we would say, no, that is not a point on our function's graph. What are they asking in B? Remember, that was a little bit different than C here. In B, they are asking you, if x is negative 2, what is f of x? So what is that asking again? It's asking you to find the y value, isn't it? So when x is negative 2, in other words, they're saying find f of negative 2, which would have meant negative 2 gets squared, then add 2 for your numerator, then negative 2 in the denominator gets added to 4, meaning your numerator was 4 plus 2, or 6, and your denominator ends up being negative 2 plus 4, which is 2, and so you end up with the output of just 6 divided by 2, which is 3. So when the input is negative 2, the output is 3. So this is basic input-output stuff at this point. Now in C, that's when things get interesting, right? In C, they say, OK, if f of x is negative 2, can you tell me what x is? What inputs would have generated this output? So to let your output be a given number, you simply replace the y value with that number and then solve for x, what inputs make that happen. So here we would say negative 2 is my output, and my inputs were just x squared plus 2 over x plus 4. Now, this might cause a little bit of uh, nervousness among students. They don't like fractions typically in America. Um, but this is a simple rational, we call it rational fractional, rational equation. And that's simple because you simply have one fraction equaling another. And the easiest way to solve those is simply by cross multiplying. The other way of doing it is to find the least common denominator, multiply every term on both sides of the equation by the least common denominator, in this case x plus 4, and you'll get rid of all of those denominators. Their pesky denominators will be gone. In other words, what I meant by cross multiplying, the easier way here, this is really negative 2 over 1. So if you had cross multiplied there, you would have ended up getting negative 2 times x plus 4, in parentheses, equaling 1 times x squared plus 2, which is just x squared plus 2. So if you were to actually do the math here, this is distributing negative 2x minus 8 must equal x squared plus 2. You get a quadratic equation here. So again, I would recommend to finish this one off, you'd get like x squared plus 2x, move the 8 over to a positive 8, so now it's 8 plus 2, which is 10. So you'd have to solve x squared plus 2x plus 10 equals 0. Now, when you try to do that using the quadratic formula or completing the square, what you'll end up getting, if you take the time to do it, is you'll end up getting a situation where you have a negative under the square root, which is imaginary. And that means that there are no real solutions. In this case, that's telling you that it's impossible to produce an output of negative 2. And if you take a look at the graph, you'll see why that is. So this ends up giving you no such solutions. And if there are no solutions, like a circle with a line through it means the same thing. If there are no solutions, that's the answer, right? That's telling you no inputs will ever give you this output. Now, this happens sometimes. You might be thinking, why did I do all that math just to get that kind of answer? Well, sometimes you ask yourself, how, much, how many hours a week would I need to work in order to buy the new iPhone, right? You do the math and you say, OK, here's the answer. I just need to work 25 hours a day, right? That's a solution mathematically that is correct. However, it doesn't actually, it's not actually feasible in real life, right? We only have 24 hours in a day. Similarly, there is a way to get an output of negative 2, but it would require you to break the laws of the universe. And so we're going to say, nope, that can't happen, OK? There is no solution. Finally, the last three questions here are talking about domain and intercepts, OK? Domain was easy. We simply say, are there any restrictions on my domain? And how do we know if there are restrictions on the domain again? We look for fractions or square roots. There is a denominator here. And what did we know about d domains for denominators, right? Denominators can't equal 0. So we would have said that x plus 4 cannot equal 0. How do I write that in interval notation? Do you remember? Well, that would really mean that x can't equal negative 4. And if you can't be a, a simple number, that means you can be anything to the left of it and anything to the right of it, but you can't be the number itself. In other words, did you say negative infinity until negative 4 parentheses, union negative 4 until infinity? If you did, well done. OK, last couple questions. Intercepts, here we go. For the intercepts, again, x-intercepts, what did that mean for you? That meant your y values had to equal 0. So you would set your output equal to 0, and just like we did in part C, C and E are very similar because you're having to set the output equal to something. You're going to see if this is possible. So when you do that here, I'll come up here for this one, for the x-intercept conversation. Okay, When you do that here, you'd get that 0 is our output when we have an input of x, and we're squaring it, adding 2, and dividing by x plus 4. How did we solve a rational equation like that? 
we cross multiplied. So zero times anything is zero, that's just zero. Can zero ever equal one times x squared plus two? Let's take a look. Can zero equal x squared plus two? Well, that would mean that x squared would have to equal a negative two, wouldn't it? And can you ever square something and get a negative result? No, in fact, if you wanted to go through the process, you'd end up with the square root of a negative two, which can't happen, right? So there are no x-intercepts. Again, check out the link in Desmos provided on the actual notes, and you'll see why this has no x-intercepts. Finally, the y-intercepts, the easiest thing on the whole slide. You probably wish we started with that. Y-intercepts happen when x is zero. So you're simply asked to find f of zero, which means in this case, take your input zero and square it, add two, and divide by zero, your input, plus four. So you're simply replacing x with zero. This problem was very similar to a and b. You're replacing your input with a number. So zero squared is zero, zero plus two is two. Zero plus four is four, so your answer is two fourths, or really, one half. So that is in fact a point on the graph. And it's a very funky graph, so I encourage you to check it out. Believe it or not, in a few videos, we're gonna learn how to graph these ones ourselves. All right, so good luck practicing. I know we've done a lot the last couple videos, but if you practice and make yourself confident by practicing, you're gonna become an expert at this stuff, making graphing a whole lot easier in the future. All right, I'll see you next time. And remember, math is not a spectator sport.